setting the, a foundation. And we use Daniel 2 as this template that God has given us to understand some of the prophecies in Revelation and, and in Daniel two, uh, in Daniel 7. This is our foundation for understanding Revelation. Without Daniel chapter 2, we would have no idea what Revelation means. We would have no idea what the beasts are, what, what this is, and what we're looking forward to. We would just have to make some stuff up. And so two weeks ago here, we, we did a, a base level of the groundwork of what Daniel 2 is and, and the inspiration that God gave Daniel to understand what this prophecy means and, and the impact that it has on us. And so what we're going to end up doing, we can here in Daniel 7, we're jumping ahead approximately 55 years from then. When Daniel was taken into captivity uh, into Babylon, he was a teenager. So he was just a young, my, a young guy at this point in time. So by this point here that we get in, in Daniel chapter 7 with the beasts that come out of the sea, he is much older. He's significantly older. He's got a lot more life experience. He's seen a lot of different things. Uh, this is the point also closer to when he was thrown in the lion's den. So he would have he would have been in 50s, 60s, 70s, so, so much older than he was when he was first taken into Babylon. And so there, it's this significant period of time. If you would, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. This is all we're going to stick to today. We, you don't have to jump around. There's not going to be a ton of bouncing around. I actually included, I think, all of the slides this time for the scriptures, uh, if, if you don't even want to turn there. But we're going to go through this. Uh, we're going to see these four beasts that ride up, uh, rise up out of the sea. This lion with eagle's wings, uh, a bear, a uh, leopard with wings, and then this terrifying beast that comes about. And so this is what we find here in Daniel chapter 7. If you start in the very beginning, the first three verses say, In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had dreams and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote them down, telling the, man, uh, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my visions by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Four beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So he, he, describe, he uh, comes here, he lays out this template for us of what we're going to look at here in chapter 7. And this is all, we have to keep this whole mindset of Daniel chapter 2. Don't forget this, this pattern of this statue that went from the head of gold, which represented the Babylonians, the chest and arms of silver, which was the Medo-Persian Empire. Greece came after them as the belly and thighs of bronze. And then the Romans who came in, that represented the two legs of, of iron. And so this is that foundation that we have. And this is that template that we're using so that we can better understand these, these beasts that come out of the sea. If you look at verse 4, verse 4 says, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. After this, it goes on to describe the other beasts. We're, we're actually, we will go there. We're not going to do it right now. Uh, if we think about this, if we only had Daniel 7, we start getting this random ideas of what this means. This is why it's so important that we use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Or we use this basis from Daniel, 7, uh, Daniel 2 that God gave us, and we run with that as understanding the rest of what this is talking about. But I want to drop down to verse 17. If you can drop down to verse 17 really quick. Because we're not making random assumptions. We're not just guessing what this means. If we use the Bible, we, we start to get a bigger picture of what's happening or what's going to happen. So verse 17 says, Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. So we, we look at these animals and we start to think, okay, what could this mean? What could these crazy beasts mean? We, we have some of these animals who still exist today that are similar to what we see, but come, kind of combined together. And so we could potentially make up some things of what this is if we didn't have anything else to go on. But it tells us here that these four that arise out are four kings or four kingdoms, which plays into that Daniel 2. Now, this first one is a lion. This is what we link back to Daniel chapter 2. You're going to hear me say that a lot today because that head of gold, if you remember, in Daniel 2, God specifically said that the Babylonians were going to be conquered by an empire that is inferior to them. God says they're inferior. So they weren't 
there was a, a majest, uh, something majestic about the Babylonians. There was something to them that was better than the others. Even though they were inferior, they were able to still conquer them. And what we have here for this first one, which is going to represent Babylon as well, is this lion with eagle's wings. Now, if you want to write down your notes, in Jeremiah 4.7 and Jeremiah 50.44, Babylon is referred to as a lion. And then in Ezekiel 17.3 and verse 12, Babylon's referred to as an eagle. So we have extra resources from uh, the Bible that show that actually compare Babylon to this lion and this eagle that we continue to use as this representation that describes this kingdom which was represented by that head of gold. Babylon was this majestic kingdom that they had a lot of wealth especially for the period that they lived in. Uh, nothing compared to them outside of Egypt. Egypt did pretty well for themselves but Babylon outside of Egypt just had this special special uh, wealth and whatever if it was God's protection why they became so powerful and, and why they were able to do the things they did we're not really sure but we can see what it is when we think about it it's like going from the slums uh, the the Red Roof Inn to the Ritz Carlton uh, there's this huge gap between the two it's it'd be like picking somebody up who lives in a third world country in the middle of Africa and dropping them to the center of New York this is what Babylon had that the rest of that, the, the empires didn't, the rest of the world at that time didn't have. There was a big difference. And so Babylon made this big stance, and that's, that's why they, they had the empire that they did. And we see that there was this huge impact on Judah. There was this impact that they had, this interaction that they had with Judah, where they actually ended up taking Jews away into captivity. And when we see the story of Daniel and how that all plays out, it's really interesting to see how God works with that. It's interesting how the Babylonians actually represented themselves. You'll find figures like this, which is a lion with eagle's wings with a man's head. And so, so we continue to see this pattern, this representation of how they even saw themselves that is reflected out of the Bible. And we see this pattern that keeps coming. The Ishtar Gate entrance, if anybody's had the privilege to be there in person, I never have, but thankfully we have the internet, which you can find any picture of anything you want. So I, I snatched that one. And this is one of the gates that the Babylonian Empire would have had at the, their front gate, uh, the, the uh, Ishtar Gate, which is now in a museum. But they have these lions, these yellow lions on this blue glazed brick, which is beautiful. Again, going to back to that majesty that this Babylonian Empire had. And it was fashioned in this high relief. So you can see the intricacy, the, the knowledge that they had of the arts, the artistic abilities that they had. And so when we go, went through Daniel 2, we focused on these four empires and how they appeared from that standpoint of the gold, silver, bronze, and iron. In Daniel 7, we get these different depictions. We get these characteristics that seem to fit more like the society, more like their attitude, uh, the inner workings of, of what Babylonian Empire was, and we'll see that as well as with, with the other empires as we go through this. And when we think about it, lions are brutal. If you've ever watched a lion hunt, we've been watching lots of nature shows lately, my family and I, and the lions are just absolutely brutal when it comes down to it. And that's what the Babylonians did. The Babylonians swept across, and if you didn't get on board with their government and their system, they just completely kill your entire army, they displace all the citizens, and they basically force you to get on, on page with everybody else. And so there's this brutality that they had as they reigned over their empire. Now, if you go back, drop down to verse 5. This is where we start to get into the other beast and see what they are. And this says, verse 5, Suddenly another, bear, uh, another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now, there have been attempts to take Daniel 7 and make this solely into a modern prophecy. That this has nothing to do historically, but this is something that's going to take place now. Uh, many of you may have heard, too, the Soviet Union referred to as the Soviet bear. And the, the problem with this ideology and this thinking is that the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they, they were defeated and therefore, this, so this Russian bear is kind of taken out of context when we, when we look at the Bible and see how history has played out. 
And so it can't only apply to modern times. It just doesn't fit with the, the mentality of, we have, of what we're looking at with the Bible and how history has played out. And you, you can see sometimes as human beings, we make these assumptions and we make these predictions and we start to pinpoint and say, this has to be it. This is exactly what it is. And this is why I always warn everybody every time we get into prophecy, be careful. We don't pinpoint dates. We don't pinpoint people. All we do is use this as a basis and a reference point to say when it happens, we can go, oh, this is how you're doing it. Gotcha. Your plan is still working. Yes, we see you're in control. Prophecy is designed so that we can see that God is still in control. And God is going to play out his plan no matter what we try to do as human beings. And so we, we try to get away from this and, and try, to, try to stay away from trying to make these predictions and assumptions. Um, and we watch history play out. And so what we want to do is oftentimes think of what this meant to the original audience. And Daniel 2 really helps us in understanding what, what that meant to Daniel in his time when the Medo persian Empire conquered Babylon. They took over that area. And we try to figure out what it means historically, starting with Babylon, and we use that template as our prophetic guidance, our prophetic guideline and path to follow this through. And so we, we carry on down, we get the second beast here in verse 5. This is the Medo-Persian Empire. It's characterized by this bear that's raised up on one side. And there's a attempts to, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know if this is really what God is inferring here, if this is what he's doing or if we're just grasping at straws. But the idea that this bear is raised up on one side kind of plays into this dual empire. It wasn't just the... Persian Empire, it was the Medo-Persian Empire, the Medians. And what it, what it shows is the significance that the Persians actually dominated the Medes. Uh, they, they took more control over it and they, they had a bigger impact. And so I don't know if these are profound clues that God is trying to give us to help us to understand this prophecy, or later on God says, nope, didn't mean that at all. And we're going to go, okay, sure. But it's interesting sometimes to look at these and see if he's giving us these context clues that we can try to pinpoint some of this stuff and, and try to help us to watch it a little bit better and understand it a, on a different le uh, degree. But the Persian element definitely dominated the median, per uh, the median element. And so whether that's the real full explanation, I don't know. I, I can't tell you definitively, but in human rationale and thinking, it kind of makes sense. And sometimes that's the downfall of human rationale and thinking is that it's human. God has a different plan in a different place. Sometimes uh, we, we have to not use our logic, but God's logic. There's another interesting aspect, as you can see in this bear. The description they give is that there's three ribs in his mouth. And we uh, qu quickly referenced this when we went through Daniel 2 of the three empires. I, I was thinking back, I may have misspoke. If you wrote down the, the Libyan empire, it was the Lydian empire. I looked back at my notes and I had put a B instead of a D, so it was very likely. Maybe I spoke fast enough that you didn't understand me and you had to go look it up. That was what I was hoping. Uh, but when the Persians came in, they took over the Babylonian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, and the Lydian Empire. Uh, so the, this, this representation, these three ribs, we, we believe is that those three empires that they took over when they seized power. So this bear was commanded to devour much flesh. And when we think about what the Persians were able to do, what they, what they did do, the sheer size of their empire was enormous. And it was something greater than the, the Babylonian Empire. If you remember back when we talked about the, the Daniel 2, we looked how each of these empires continued to grow and get bigger. Uh, the Persians pushed heavily east, started and even stretched all the way down over into India. But the amount of territory that the Persians were able to consume, it was enormous for that period. For that time frame, it just was something ridiculous. Uh, we, we mentioned that the Greeks, they had about a 50, 30 to 50,000 man army. There are estimates all the way up to 1 million is what they think the Persians may have had. Uh, that may be a little bit above, but if we look at the, just the comparison and the sheer size, that, that's a huge difference. It's a large difference. And also, I just want to note again, if you remember, the, the Romans were never able to conquer the Persians. When the Romans took control after Greece, every time they tried to push into the east, 
Persia fought back, and they kind of kept coming up at a stalemate. They were never able to push into the Persian area and take over what Persia had had. And there was so much bloodshed that they ended up just kind of redirecting. They, they <laughs> made a pact to leave each other alone, and they said, you don't come over here, we don't come over there, and, and they made this pact. So the, there was still this dominance that they kind of had, even though the Greeks took them over. So if we drop now, now to verse 6. Daniel 7, verse 6, it says, After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast, had four, uh, the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. I've mentioned this a couple times, but what we're getting into is the Greek empire here. It's characterized with four heads and four wings. Um, it, this is very different from that big, slow, lumbering bear that the Persians are represented by. This is a quick animal, uh, one of the things, even though the Persians had that massive territory, the Persians tried to govern every bit of it. They tried to have control of every bit of the city-states that they had. They kept their, the, basically it boiled down to the king wanted to have his hand in every pot. And so what they did, the Persian king uh, was seen as a deity, had supreme rule, uh, what was basically a god. And so they would have full control over the empire. Everybody answered, every province answered back to the king. And this created some problem because everything was a little bit slower. It, it became difficult to manage that many people, but they, they somehow did this in, a, in an organized way and nothing could get done without the king demanding a decree. If you remember back with Daniel, that's what happened with him. The king was tricked into making a decree which got Daniel thrown into the lion's den and by the grace of God, God protected Daniel and, and the king was able to get out of that. Uh, but even the king, after he made that decree, he couldn't go back on his word. The king had to stick by his decree. And so this is what governed the entire Persian empire. And thankfully, we see God's hand playing out to make sure that uh, Daniel is protected. But it would have been a very different thing if, if this was done in a sense where God goes, okay, we're just going to let this play out. And, it, and we, we rely that God is going to fulfill his plan. God is giving us protection at times. That doesn't mean we are protected from every little thing that we come through. But we know God is in this because we watch it play out. And so we, we have this, this different beast from that giant bear, that, that slow bear, this, this foreheads, the the wings, we think of eagles being quick, uh, birds being fast, they're able to move quick, they're able to turn quick, uh, leopards are very quick, they're stealthy, uh, you don't see them coming generally. And so the Persians army was built from a whole bunch of different nationalities because they were so big of what they brought in. And so they kind of had these specialists in every, whether it was archers or spearmen or infantry, what, whatever they ended up being, they had somebody that could fight any type of battle the downfall of that, though, for the generals is how, how do you conduct a battle when you have that many men? How do you keep everybody in sync and in, in unison and on the battlefield? And that's why the Greeks were able to conquer the Persians. It's because they were a much smaller force, but they were designed so that they did it with unity and with speed. And they were able to outmaneuver and outplay. And we think about modern day, we can think about in the United States, we have our SEAL teams. They're small, they're stealthy, and they execute without you even knowing they're there. And they're good at what they do. That's kind of that difference between the Persians and the Greeks. The Greeks were, had, the, had the training, had the specialties. Uh, they had armor plating, which helped them, and which the Persians did not have. Or we think about, I may have skipped a slide. Sometimes I get talking and I quit clicking the button. So Alexander the Great, I don't think I missed one. So Alexander the Great, he went through his opponents really quick. Uh, this is called the phallic formation. I'm probably butchering that, but uh, it's P-H-A-L-A-N-X, phallic. And what this is, it's a military formation that Alexander the Great used with his army. Well, what this is, if you can see, it's basically rows and rows of men with 20 foot long spears. So they had their shields out front with kind of interlocking and what they would do, they would drop multiples of these spears. So as you got two or three feet between each of the men, 
you had this two or three gap. So you, you had a spear at 20 feet, 18, 16, 14, somewhere similar to that. You had these massive spears, and they would just move as this unit. And they were able to just basically bulldoze their opponents and walk right through them. Uh, many of the people that they fought ended up being trampled in these battles and these fights because how, how do you get to that? How do you even reach that army? And so this is one of the reasons that they moved so fast is because they literally just bulldozed through everybody and just went straight through. Um, because they moved so quick, they didn't govern the same way that the Persians did. They, they weren't able to set up these little provinces. They weren't able to set up these governments. So what the Greeks ended up doing, they had decided to set up culture centers. This is where we get into Hellenization. What is Hellenization? It is just the spread of Greek culture. They would teach the areas about Greek culture, about the arts, uh, about the Greek religion, how to do sculptures, how to do math. Uh, they would teach people what it was to be Greek. Anybody who was non-Greek, they wanted to become Greek. So they didn't try to rule them, but they put up these culture centers so that they could have a heavy influence. And when we get into Bible study today, I'll talk about this a little bit because we are still, even today, dealing with Greek culture. Some of what we deal with in Christianity is still remnant of what the Greeks were able to do with their impression of that. The speed at which they did things kind of represents that leopard, uh, how fast they moved across the land. Uh, if you remember, the empire ended up breaking up into four different groups. And these are those four groups, the, the Macedonian, the Pergamum, and then the two that are more important, the Seleucids and Ptolemies, which were up in, uh, down in Egypt and up in the Babylonian area. They're the ones that we see trampling back, across, back and forth across Israel for years fighting each other. And so they have a bigger impact on Israel than the other two. But again, we see that representation of the four wings or the four heads kind of dividing up into these four different empires, which looks like it fits this template from Daniel 2. It helps us to see historically that it's, maybe this is what God is showing us. This is the point that he's trying to make to give us more information historically to say, okay, we're watching this play out. We're watching Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are the same set of, of kingdoms that we're dealing with here. If you drop down to verse 7 and 8, here it says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, and it was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that came before, that, that were before, and it had ten horns, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in, in, the, the, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and speaking pompous words. So now we get to this description of something like they've never seen before. This force, fourth beast that seems even more dangerous, more, more vicious, and just domineering. This fourth beast is something that's not described like the other ones. It, Daniel doesn't even try to depict it as an actual animal for us. He just says it's basically trampling everything, eating up everything, and it just tramples underfoot whatever is left. This is a, a perfect description of the Roman Empire and what they were capable of and what they did historically uh, because the Roman Empire was the most powerful force that we'd ever seen for hundreds of years. They lasted much longer than any of the other empires. It was a, this massive military force for hundreds of years. And a lot of that was because of the technology and the training that they had. Uh, similar to the Greeks, they dedicated time and energy to their military presence, and, and it showed. It, it, there was a reason that this happened. They trained their soldiers as this giant military unit. They knew how to work together. They, they knew what they were supposed to do. But on the battlefield, when they broke into smaller groups, they still functioned as if they were that big unit. Even though they broke apart, 
they still formed a smaller military unit that still functioned, that was still coordinated, and it was still attacked the same way that the bigger army would. And then they even went a step further, they trained everybody individually how to fight, how to, to conduct military matters. And so because of this, because of, of being trained in these basically three different phases, they were a, a military force like nobody had ever seen before. Some of the technology that we found from the Romans is that they, they basically invented the, a Gatlin gun that fired arrows. Uh, another one that they have is the, the uh, ballista. That's, kinda, that's what uh, you can see the pictures of on the slideshow. It's this massive catapult-like contraption that shoots, I don't even call them arrows, it's more like a javelin. They, they say, they pr estimate that the javelins or rocks would have been anywhere from 60 to 200 pounds. So when these things went off, this wasn't taking out one guy or, or just injuring one person. You're talking about killing two, three, four guys every time this thing went off, and they, they got really good with it. Um, it. It's not just arrows, it's javelins. And so the technology that they came up with, it showed that they actually put time and thought and energy into mastering this machinery which helped them to be this dominating force for so many years, and it was amazing. Uh, for hundreds of years, the Roman Empire continued to conquer the Mediterranean area all the way up into Europe, and they were just this force to be reckoned with. And so when we have this force, fourth beast that it talks about, one thing that Daniel mentions in here is that it has these, four, or these ten horns, or these ten kings on its head. If you drop down, Drop down to verse 19. The neat thing about reading through some of Daniel's stuff is understanding that God wasn't always cut and dry and saying, hey, this is exactly what this means. This is exactly what this means. Here in verse 19, this is what we, we see from Daniel. It says, Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces, trampled with residue, uh, the re trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. And so, so this is Daniel saying, I don't understand what you're showing me. He goes, I don't understand what you're trying, what, what you want me to get out of this. I need to, I need, I want to know this better. I want to understand this a little better. And so if you drop back to verse 13 now, drop back to verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. This is that kingdom that we heard about in special music, that government that's going to come that will never go away, the kingdom of God. That's a similar description to what we found in Daniel 2 when we went through it. We have these same events being described. They're just depicted very different. It's not a statue of metals that we see in our lands, but they're depicted by these animals with the characters and the, the behaviors of this. Uh, Babylon, the, the lion with wings, Persia, this giant bear, and then we have the Greeks who were quick and ferocious. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the video of the leopard hunting crocodiles. It's amazing. You can see how ferocious they really are. Uh, a leopard actually dives into the water and comes out with a crocodile. Uh, these are not animal, these are not cats to be messed with. They're, they may look cute, but they're not. And that's what we saw with the Greeks. The Greeks were a, a domineering empire, uh, which ended up breaking up into those four divisions. And eventually this Roman empire comes in with the ten horns and this little horn. And Daniel's going, this, this bothers me. These ten horns and this little horn, this bothers me because I'm, I'm not sure what, what to make sense of this. He goes, I, I don't understand what you're trying to show me here. If you look down at verse 21, verse 21, he says, 
I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. How long will the saints war? Or how long will this war happen with the saints? Verse 22 says, Until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the, the, of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So what we're given here, we know this little horn is doing something against God's saints, something against God's people, all the way down to the return of Jesus Christ. There's this warring that is going on, this influence that this little horn has that is impacting God's saints. And so just like we know the Roman Empire does, these revivals that we've talked about leading up to that end time, uh, the, the ten, ten phases of that. And look at verse 23. Verse 23 says, Thus he says, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. Uh, now there's questions that, does this resurrected empire at the end time actually conquer the entire world, all of the known lands? We know no because of Revelation. What we're told in Revelation, we, we always, we talked about this when we went through Daniel 2, the scope of what God's prophecies are is always revolving around Israel. It's this finely tuned view of what impacts Israel. This isn't the whole world that's going to come under this but we, we know they do have a major influence in, in a lot of different areas, but it's not going to be the literal entire world that, that falls under this resurrected Roman Empire. Look at verse 24. Verse 24 says, The ten horns and ten kings who shall arise from the kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Remember it said this little one had eyes like a, uh, eyes and speaks like a man. There's pompous words. In verse 25, it says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intent to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into, the hand of, uh, into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So now we're given some um, specifics that we are not given in Daniel chapter 2. We're, we're given new information, specifics of these ten kings and, and this little king, this little horn. How they're persecuting the saints all the way up to the time that Jesus Christ returns. And then there's, it gives us a specific time frame, time, times, and half a time. What this means, uh, there's a Hebrew idiom that actually references, the, that refers to this time as time being one year. Times would be the smallest plural of time, which would be two years, and then half a time, which would be a, a half a year. So this gives us a three and a half period, of, three and a half year time period that this is going to be taking place. So this is happening, that this, in, that this influence of this little horn of uh, basically destroying and trying to devour and trying to war with the saints is going to be all taking place. And so we see that these, this impact of, the, of what is going on, uh, what is happening, and why, why God is showing us through these steps that he's given to us of how impactful the Roman Empire is and the influence that they've had. And we see that this, this longevity of their rule leads all the way down to the end time, that there's still this presence of this Roman Empire, this revived Roman Empire. And so oftentimes we try to piece this together and start to understanding what, what God's talking about. There's basically three different explanations of this, this timing that's going to take place. Uh, the first one is that this empire, this final beast, is actually a resurrected Greek empire, not the Romans. So that doesn't really fit biblically. Uh, we've kind of discarded that one, thrown it out. Uh, so I'm not even going to touch on that one or what the explanations are because it's not biblically based. We, we don't find a foundation of that, of the Greeks being that last empire in the Bible. The second one that we consider is it's a progression of time, that there are revivals of the Roman Empire. There's going to be ten revivals of the Roman Empire, 
before we get to the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, these 10 restorations happen all along the way, and that there's this, we're basically waiting. We're counting empires all the way up to, to the end time. Uh, this kind of plays into a little bit. It talks about, there's a reference to the, the three of the first horns. So if it's referencing three of the first horns, then that kind of gives us this, there's a progression of time, because if they're first, there's something that has to come after them. And so that was in verse 8, if you want to note that. But something has to come after those first ones. And so we start to look at this and, and try to understand the implications of what this means with 10, 10 resurrections of the Roman Empire and what that would mean. Uh, This makes sense biblically. If we look at what the Bible says and how, how God has laid this out, we can go back through history and try to put together a progression of empires that tried to resurrect the Roman Empire. We talked about that a little bit last time. I kind of mentioned some of the, the men who flared up these rebellions. Uh, I have listed some of the ones that could theoretically be these empires. And with the nine that are up there, that means we're waiting on this final one. There would be one more. Uh, and again, this isn't definitive information. Don't write this down as this is exactly what's going to happen. These are the exact uh, w empires that God is referring to. Because what has always happened is this is the theory that from before the 1800s, this was the main theory that commentators had. This was the main ideology. But the problem with that is there's been a uh, an additional 200 years since all of those commentators wrote all of this. So their resurrected empires would be different from what we have today. Because as time goes on, we see different men come into power and be this resurrected empire. And so we still, we need to be cautious and careful about how we do this and how, how we look at this. But this makes sense biblically as, as to how this would work out with Ten, a, a progression of time of these resurrected empires taking place, uh, these new powers that would be, be uh, in presence. The third explanation, which is more common today, is that these, these ten horns that we're talking about here in Daniel 7 are ten kings that are going to exist simultaneous. Uh, you, you may think about some type of European Union, some conglomerate of unified countries that, that may have this power that would exist at the same time uh, near the end of the time and this little horn would be the Antichrist uh, that religious power that has an influence and we, we think about this from the, the standpoint of all of that's leading up to some unified power in Europe that is going to create this beast that's going to have that same impact that we see in Daniel 7, talking about how they trample over people, the, the power that they have, and the influence that they have. So both of these explanations make sense, whether it's a progression of time, of actual empires that come and go all the way until we have 10 empires, or that there's these 10 kings who exist at the same time at the end time. Uh, both of those make sense. Both, both of those could apply. And when we really think about it, there's not a whole lot of difference between the two when it comes down to the end result. They both lead us to the return of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it, it really doesn't change anything that we do. It doesn't change our day-to-day. -day. It doesn't change the fact that we try to be better Christians, be more like Jesus Christ. It has no bearing on how we live our lives. Uh, it does change on what we, we look at sometimes when we look through prophecy, but it doesn't change who we are or what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. When you think about, if you remember back uh, what we just read in verse 25, it speaks, it talks about the, that little horn who speaks, speaks pompous words against the Most High, and it's talking about God persecuting the saints all the way until the, the return of Jesus Christ. One of the things that it mentioned there was he, he intends to change times and law. When we think about changing times and changing law, from a humanity standpoint, our government changes laws all the time, Right? All our laws are constantly changing, modifying, adapting. Uh, the government that we live under changes laws to do what they think they better appeases the people that they represent. So it doesn't have that big of an impact from the, the point of, we, of what we live in and how we do it because we see it all the time. 
But when we think about changing the times and the law of God, that has a very different implication. It has a very different stance of what it is doing, especially to the Christian world. We've seen for many, many years there uh, an attempt to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. It's been a constant battle for a couple thousand years now. And pretty early on out of uh, the first century church, we start to see this evolve and this to develop that there's this battle that the Sabbath is no longer valid. These times and these laws of God and, and what is expected. And so there's been this concentrated effort, even within Christianity, to destroy what God says is his law. What God says is the expectations of us, uh, the times and the, God, uh, the, the times and the law of God. And so that has an impact on what we look at and what we see, especially when we think about what this religious leader is going to be doing, not only persecuting the saints of that end time, but the things that they are going to represent, the, the impact that they're going to have, the changes that they're going to try to make. At the end of verse 25, it said, then the saint shall be given into the hand for a time, times, and half a time. And so that's where we get into that period where we, we see this struggle going on. To be honest with you, we live in a pretty cushy world. Our Christianity is not tough right now. It's not difficult to be a Christian. We don't have bars on our doors when we come to Sabbath services. We don't have people trying to stone us or shoot us or kill us when we come to Sabbath services. There's going to be a time where that happens. There's going to be a time where we are persecuted for obeying the laws of God. There will be a time where Christianity will be hard. This is why God gives us these prophecies, to show that he's in control. We don't have to be fearful of these, but it gives us motivation and it lights a fire under us to say, we need to know our Bibles better, we need to have a better relationship with God, we need to have a better relationship with one another. He's saying, get ready. Be prepared. He says, because, because during this time period, it's going to get real rocky. This is going to be a struggle. And so we see the, this, this understanding that Daniel is given by God. And it really, this helps us to understand exactly what God's talking about when we get into Revelation. Uh, for everybody visiting with us, what we were going to get into a couple months ago, I was going to talk, I was going to give a sermon on the mark of the beast and what I ended up doing I kind of changed course and revamped and said you know it's important that we understand Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 because Daniel 2 is the template Daniel 7 follows that template and then when we get into Revelation the only reason we have any idea what Revelation means is because of this this is the foundation and so I wanted to take the time to go through this thoroughly and give everybody an explanation of what God gave Daniel and why he gave it to him and just like you know, God follows his own pattern, if you read in the Old Testament, he always talks about two or three witnesses. He gives us two witnesses. He gives us these two different explanations of, of this prophecy that he lays out and says, this is what's going to happen. This is the progression that you need to watch for, that you're going to be looking at, that's actually going to take place. And he goes, and this is the battle that you're going to have to fight. He goes, my laws and my times are going to be destroyed. There's going to be trampled on, and you're going to be persecuted. And so this is the promise that God gives us. He says, these things are going to happen, He goes, but I win. My kingdom trumps all of this. No matter how much persecution takes place, no matter what they try to do to destroy my way of life, he says, my kingdom's coming. He says, Jesus Christ will return, and you just have to stick to the truth. You have to stick with it. Look at verse 26 and 27. Verse 26. He says, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. My countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Just like Daniel, we read through some of this stuff, and we're going, I don't want to go through that. 
that doesn't sound pleasant. It doesn't sound fun. It doesn't sound enjoyable. But we know that we win in the end. We know that if we stick to this, Jesus Christ is going to return. Our Messiah has already died for our sins. And it's our job to understand that commitment. It's our job to get baptized and say, I want part of this. I want to be part of your family. I want to be part of this kingdom. I love what you're doing. This is what God is helping us to see. And God introduces a new concept here, that the saints will rule. This is something new. We don't see this many times in, in the Old Testament. He says the saints are going to have this power. Yeah, you may have been persecuted for three and a half years, but guess what? You have dominion over everything forever. There's a power that we're given. Go back to verses 13 and 14 again. So with all of this, with all this context that we've now gone through with Daniel 7, this understanding of what these beasts are going to do, the, the persecution that we will be under, look at Daniel verse 13, chapter 7. It says, I was watching in night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with, with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages shall, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. This is what we wait for. This is why this is the time of year that we get so excited. As we get into trumpets and atonement, atonement's not that fun, but you know we do it because we understand the closeness that we get to God. Nobody likes to be hungry. But think about that persecution that we're going through as your stomach's grumbling that day. That's kind of the whole point of that. It's not to sleep it off. It's not to sleep through the day. But it's to remind us what God's doing, the plan that he has, and say, hey, draw closer to me. My, I am your sustenance. It's not physical things. He goes, you're going to need me because the physical things are going to destroy you. If he allows that, the physical things will destroy us. And so he tells us, he goes, not only does Jesus Christ come and rule and have dominion, he goes, the saints are going to be with him. This is what you guys are being designed for. It's this kingdom, that millennial reign that we have teaching God's way of life to all of humanity. And so we put all of this together. We, we put the template of Daniel 2. We, we lay on top of it Daniel 7 and say, this matches up. These empires match up to what Daniel 2 gives us and what we understand more thoroughly in depth of what those kingdoms looked like, how they acted, the impact that they had. But we see Jesus Christ approaching the Ancient of Days. We, we know that's God the Father, that relationship that they have here. And Jesus Christ has given authority, dominion, a kingdom that never fails, never ends, never ceases. And so it's why this foundation is so important. And so I want to say, lay this groundwork as we get into the next set of talking, getting into Revelation, and, and we'll, we'll start to talk about what the mark of the beast is a little bit. We'll look at what's going on right now with the Ukrainian and Russian war that has a big influence on, on what is happening in that whole area of the world. And we, we see some of these things possibly playing out. Well, only time will tell, uh, but it's important to understand that God is in control. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be anxious. But God's plan is coming true. 